morning, church. Morning. Good morning, church. Morning. Come, let's rise and respond to the call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him, bless His name. For the Lord, the Lord is, good. is good, His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. What wonderful words from Psalm 100. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's come together to give God all the glory. Amen. To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for endures forever. So let us sing our praises to Him. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing
seasons change but Lord your love for us is steadfast and unchanging we can never truly understand how much you love us but help us help us as, to understand as much as possible and Jesus help us to turn our eyes to you even though times can be challenging and it can be difficult to persevere in following in your footsteps. Jesus, help us be reminded of who you are and just how much you love us.
so good to us in all our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you have been so faithful, a heavenly Father that runs after us with your goodness. We really thank you, Father, for how much you love us. 
Take a seat as we continue our worship by going to our God in prayer. Psalm 36 says, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Men and beasts you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love. The children of all mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you, is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. Father, this morning we want to thank you, Lord, for your unfailing love. You love us when we are sinners, falling short of your glory. You give us the gift of life, when our future could have been an endless darkness. Lord, you love us even when we are complaining about our lives in this world with much uncertainties, sufferings, mentally and physically. But Lord, you ensure that we have enough just as you care for the lilies in the field, the birds in the sky. Lord, you care for us, your children. Lord, you love us even when our bodies are failing, when some of us may be sick, may be unwell. But Lord, you ensure that your grace continue to be sufficient for us. For we know that we have an all-powerful God whom we can pray to and whom we can receive peace from. For Lord, you are ensured that we will see your mercies day after day. And we can be assured, like what the psalmist say, in the, in the valley of shadow of death, Lord, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. You love us, Lord, even when we think that you have not heard our prayer. And even when we feel so hopeless. But Lord, actually you are carrying out your plans behind us, even when we are not knowing it. Your plan for us to prosper and not to harm us. And your plan to grant us a future. And Lord, you love us even when we feel anxious and restless over what is happening around us and around the world. All the chaos and conflict, Lord, are depriving us from all the peace that we are looking for. But instead, Lord, you continue to make us lie on green pastures. You continue to lead us along still water. For you are our shepherd and we are your sheep. And indeed, Lord, your rod and your staff, they comfort us. So Lord, for many of us who may be going through difficult times at this moment, Lord, may we reminded, be reminded, Lord, of the price that you have paid out of love for us. The price of our Lord Jesus, who went through the journey of carrying his own cross, suffering immense humiliation and pain. The price of having to be crucified, not for his own inequities, but for our wrongdoing and for our transgressions. Lord, your love for us is simply beyond description. 
and without boundaries, and that we can be assured of. So, Father, even as we journey to become a disciple-making church, Lord, may we ask that you grant us a heart of humility. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Lord, we also ask that, Father, you will give us a heart to serve. Even if we have to find time from our busy schedule. For, Lord, you have taught us about your sacrificial love for us. And hence, we want to learn to serve not out of convenience, but out of our heart and willingness to serve because you love us. Father, as we need more people to step forward to serve in both ministries and church committees, we pray that, Lord, you'll raise up men and women who have the hearts to serve and to continue your good work in Agape. And we also pray for this season of financial budgeting for our church. Lord, we ask that you will grant us wisdom. You will grant wisdom to the finance team and to LCEC in their budgeting and approval process. For Lord, the resources that we have, they all belong to you. So we pray that, Father, they will be placed for good use according to your purpose. We also want to commit all the other ministries, Lord, be it children ministry, young adult, youth, even our Chinese congregation, Lord, we, and our missions committee, Lord, we want to commit everything into your hands as they are doing your good work, Lord. We just want to ask that you strengthen them as they go along and you continue, Lord, to be with them in their journey, Lord. Continue to grant them courage, in the spirit of not giving up to do good. For Lord, we know that we can do all things through you who strengthen us. So even as we are looking around the world that is full of so many uncertainties, the war, climate, climate warming, and even all the regional conflicts, Lord, that are not seem to get better, but it seemed to es escalate even to a much higher level. Lord, we just want to put this burden under your feet. For Lord, there are many things that we can't do much about it, but Lord, we know that you, God, can move mountains. So we trust that, Father, you have a plan to help, work, to help us, to help this world. We ask that, Lord, you were instilled in the hearts of the leaders around the world, the hearts to embrace peace and not war, the hearts to embrace love and not conflict. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, this morning for listening to our prayer. As we conclude our corporate prayer, Lord, we just want to pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptations, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Morning, church. Morning. Welcome to this beautiful Sunday morning service.
Our Lord is good, for this is the day that He has created. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Right. Um, before we start our announcement this morning, um, can I have a show of hands of anyone here who are here with us for the very first time in Agape? Can I just have a show of hands? Any newcomers, very first time? Or maybe the second time? Oh, yes. Gentlemen at the right side. Yeah, do join us for our community lunch after service. We have a community lunch just down there at our first level at the atrium there. So join us for, for lunch so we can get to know you more. Right. Thank you for joining us. All right, uh, maybe we shall rise and greet one another in the name of our Lord. Okay, now we shall go to our church concerns. Yep, the first announcement, I think this has been going on for many months now, the ladies' walk, right? So we are calling all ladies, come to join us for our ladies' walk on the 8th of June, which is next Saturday. We will be meeting at Raffles MRT, Passenger Service Centre, before proceeding for the walk. So please contact Wee Fong if you have any uh, questions. Right? Otherwise, we will see you there. Next. As you can see, today, one of the pastors is missing, <laughs> Pastor Jason. He's on leave, la, all right? and he's away overseas for vacation with the family. So please pray for him also and for the family uh, so that he can have a good rest and also have a good family time together. So if you need any pastoral care, obviously, Pastor Millie is here. Right, to attend to any of your uh, pastoral care needs. Next, uh, young adults, YA discipleship, uh, will be having a disciple, uh, discipleship session today in the afternoon at 1.45 p.m. in training room 8. All right, the topics covered will be dealing with life's disruption and discernment for major decisions. Right, so if you are aged between 19 to 40, I think now the age has been increased. Uh, 35, I thought initially, now become 40. Or, or, no limit, uh, okay. Even old adults can enjoy. <laughs> Just kidding. Right, so 19 to 40 years old, feel free to participate, right? There will be small snacks provided for the event as well. Is that the last one? Okay, I shall pass the time to Pastor Mili. Let us pray. Father, now as we worship you with our gifts, our offerings, we ask that you grant us hearts that are grateful, that we may give, but not unthinkingly, but reverently, cheerfully. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you come forward now and bring your offerings? Let's stand for the doxology.
Please take your seats. So our Bible reading schedules have moved over to the New Testament and we are on to the tail end of the Gospel of Matthew. So today's readings will be, um, I think it's Matthew 27 and 28, um, the crucifixion, the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus as well as his resurrection. I've chosen to read Matthew, um, to share about Matthew chapter 27, verse 32 to 50. I'm going to share some thoughts on it. Um, I added the other six verses to the 44 to make it more complete. So it's now Matthew chapter 27, verse 32 to 50. Let us pray. Father, speak your truths to us. That we may understand the love you have for us, but we may be confident, more confident of your presence and your love for us. That as we go through each circumstance in our life, each detail of our life, we may be sure, we may be confident that you understand, that you journey with us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32 to 50. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine and vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My daughter Kim is now holidaying in UK. Her initial plan was to go to Ireland and stay with her best friend, who is Irish, and then the second half to visit London. She had spent a lot of time planning. She's a very detailed person. But while they were in Ireland, her best friend's father suddenly died. Immediately, my daughter cancelled all her plans to go to London and spend the rest of the holiday in Ireland. As a father, I felt very sad. I felt that she had wasted her holiday because she had really saved up whatever little leave she had just for that trip. She had saved up a lot of money for that trip. She had made so many arrangements in London, meeting friends, visiting this place and that place. It was a holiday that she looked forward to. And suddenly, everything was cancelled because her best friend's father passed away. But to my daughter, that was nothing at all. It was something that she could do and she, had, she should do. It was the most natural thing because this was the best friend who was grieving. It got me to reflect on friendship and love. There's something maybe so precious and yet it would mean nothing if for the sake of love you would give up all that just to care for that person. But it wasn't something that she, there was not much that she could do really. It was just being with a grieving friend, spending time with a grieving friend. 
But as I reflected on this too, I realized that it is not an easy thing to share grief with another. We are quick to help another, offer help. But one of the most important things about love is really to do nothing and just be with the person. And that's where we find it so difficult. Think of the story of Job. Job had good friends, very, very close friends. They spent seven days in silence with Job as he was grieving over the death of his children, over the loss of his property, over his illness. Seven days. How many of us would spend seven days just being with a friend? Say seven days and nights, they didn't go home. They just stayed with him seven days and nights. That is what friendship is. But then Job, on the eighth day, opened his mouth and he cursed the day that he was born. Suddenly, he began to blaspheme. He began to talk about how unfair God is, that God should have killed him right from that day, that cursed be that day, that terrible day. He talked about how righteous he was. And suddenly, those friends lost their patience. They could no longer take what Job was saying. It was way too hard for them. It's okay to offer help. It's okay to, it's easier to just be with a friend. But the moment the friend in their pain talks, cries out in agony about the injustice of their lives, suddenly we lose patience with them. So often then as our friends begin, begin to talk about God deserting us or how terrible God is or how terrible people are, how often we complain about others and we say, we lose patience right away. This person never changes. The perspective never changes. Always grumbling about someone else, never about themselves. Just as the friends of Job felt about Job. He's not even admitting that he's a sinner. He's just saying that God is so unfair and that's blasphemy. And they lost patience with him. Many of us lose patience with friends like that. We, there is a limit to which we can journey with someone in pain. But sometimes, that journeying with the person in pain, sharing the person's pain is the most important thing that could happen, that we could do for that person. There was an old man in my housing estate. Every morning to late at night, he would be on the void deck. Um, in the evenings, you would see cans and cans of bottles of beer all around him. He lived in the neighborhood. He lived upstairs, actually, from my flat. He was a former church, uh, church uh, worker, and he actually gave me a whole lot of his theological books. But he had come to a point where he was so despondent, so desperate. He hated everyone. He was resentful of God. He was resentful of anyone. I happened to make friends with him because I was pretty friendly, and I sat down and talked. But listening to someone gripe about everyone else, about his church, about his family, about his neighbours, about God, every time you met, met a, met a limit for me as well. Because how much can you take a person who's always so bitter with life? And after a while, I visited him less. I spent less time. Very often, I'd just say, hey, hi, um, see you later, and then rush home. Sometimes I avoid him altogether. He was just too hard to handle, too negative to tolerate. One day on the second day of Chinese New Year, as I was waiting for the lift to come, I saw his body fly down from upstairs and land right in front of me. He had killed himself in despair. And I asked myself often, did I do wrong? not spending more time with him. I comf comforted myself in saying that, well, really there's nothing much I could do. And yet, as I thought about it, many people do not need us to do a lot of things for them. What they need is someone who will listen to them and feel their pain. Someone who would be patient enough not to contradict him not to say, well, just trust in God and excuse me, I have to leave. Just pray, just pray. Let me pray for you. Someone who will not go that way, but someone who would want to go deeper into our pain. Listen. I learned that lesson as a rookie pastor. 
man came ostensibly for counselling. But he had so many problems. His father had just passed away. His business was failing. He was facing many lawsuits. His marriage was on the rocks. His children had rebelled. Everything was going wrong with him. And as I sat listening to his story, I felt so overwhelmed. I just broke down and cried. You hardly have a, a pastor break down and cry while trying to counsel someone else. But being a rookie, I couldn't control my emotions. And so I just broke down and cried. Almost 30 years later, he explained what had happened to him that day. He said that he had given up on life, he was going to kill himself. But when he saw me weep, and that wasn't deliberate, that wasn't a counselling skill, he just saw me weep, suddenly he realised that someone else felt his pain and he felt strength to face his problems. Over time, I realised that that was a reality. That often what we need it's not someone to do things for us, help us this, or make us full, or get rid of all evil. But simply someone who knows how we feel. Someone who will not contradict us when we talk terrible things about our feelings. Someone who will feel that pain with us. And so we read today about Jesus. Jesus, on his way to the cross, was offered an anesthetic. He was offered sour vinegar and gall. Gall is not what comes out from, it's not bile, not what comes out from a gallbladder. It is a bitter drug, narcotic, that comes from a plant. And it's meant to be an anesthetic, to numb the pain. When Jesus tasted that and knew that it was an anesthetic that would numb his pain, he rejected it. It says that he refused to drink it in verse 34. Why? Because Jesus did not want to be desensitized. He did not want to be numbed from the pain. He wanted to experience the full pain. Why was that necessary? You see, we often think that when God helps us, God loves us, means that he'll help us in all our problems. And so Jesus did. He healed the sick. He helped the blind to see. He even raised the dead. He did all these miracles, but there was one thing he knew would not take away the grief. And that is the pervasive nature of sin. Jesus can heal all diseases. Jesus can raise the dead. He can do all sorts of miracles. What he cannot do on earth is to remove sin. Because sin pervades every living being. Sin pervades all that we do and think. And there's no such a thing as the offender and the offended, the victim and the perpetrator. We are always the offended and the offender. We are always at different times or sometimes at the same time the victim and the perpetrator. And this sin remains with us. And so even if we were sick and we were fully healed, the sin of, of others and our own sin remains and we are not fully treated. And so for Jesus then to just work magic, to heal, to lay hands and all that, doesn't solve a deeper problem, the problem of sin and pain, the consequences of sin, which is pain. And Jesus, by then accepting and receiving the pain, walking through the greatest pains of all, he then showed us that he cares for us enough to journey with us. And it is when we know that Jesus and his love for us journeys, not only understands us, but wants to feel that pain, and journeys with us that we find strength to face each day. More than that, we believe then that when Jesus says in heaven there is no more crying and no more weeping, no more sin, and no more pain, we can believe him. Because it comes from a mouth of God who was not afraid to share that pain with us. It's not a glib saying that when Jesus said, don't worry, everything will be fine. Just hang on, everything will be fine. Jesus didn't do that. What he did was to go through that pain with us and even more and refuse to be sedated and to feel the full impact of that pain. That's the kind of friend, that's the kind of ruler, leader, that's the kind of king, that's the kind of God that you can trust. One who does not just say it and then run away one who feels the depth of it. 
So what, what examples do we have that Jesus, that Jesus felt the pain? What sort of pain did Jesus feel? First thing was that he found injustice and the abuse of power. In verse 2 alone, it says, As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Injustice and the abuse of power. The soldiers could force Simon to carry the cross simply because they could. No other reason. They had no right. They had no legal rights at all. They had no moral rights at all. They just found a man and said, come and do it. Why? Because they could do it. Jesus himself was crucified simply because it could be done. Not because he had done something wrong, not because the Romans had a right to do it, not because the leaders had a right to do it. They had no right at all. And yet they did it because they simply could. Injustice and the abuse of power. But that pervades all of us. Many of us have been victims of that. We have had been workers before where our boss simply said, go wash my car. Not my JD. You dare say that? Not my JD. You can't because you just got to do it because he is boss. We've had people who ask the, the subordinates to do personal things for them simply because they can. Russia could invade Ukraine simply because they can. Israel could bomb Rafa simply because they can. No legal rights, no moral rights, simply because we are powerful and we can do it. Many of us have experienced that in our lives, where people will treat us, use us, abuse us any way they want, simply because they can. But the same if we do that too. It is almost written in our lives, the strongest we live in the dog-eat-dog -dog world, we can do whatever we want if we have the bargaining power. We can force someone into do, accepting less. We can push someone into, into doing work for less pay. We look at them and say, hey, the market is very low. Huh? You just accept whatever we give you. Why? Because we can. We, you are vulnerable. We have the bargaining power. And it is almost like an accepted part of life. And yet it is unjust. It is an abuse of power. Think of it. How often has that happened to you? Or how often have you done that to someone else? That is unjust, that is unfair, that is forced simply because the one who does it can do it. This was one of the pervasive sins that was there. Something that people experienced and Jesus went through that because he understands how we feel. The second is fear. Fear is a wonderful thing because it keeps us out of danger. Fear is one of the biggest weapons of the devil. When fear is instilled in us, we, do, we are slaves to threats. Verse 33 says they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. It was called the place of the skull because it looked like a skull. But I'm sure it was a very carefully chosen place for crucifixion. What a place to be carrying a cross and walking to your crucifixion that looks like a skull. It's meant to bring, bring terror to a person. The crucifixion itself was meant to bring terror, the torture before the death. To a Jewish person, it was even more effective because in Deuteronomy chapter 21, it says, cursed is the person who hangs on the tree. And so when a person goes to the cross, there is a sense that he's not only going to be tortured to death, not only that it is a terrifying place of death, but it is a place where God curses you. It was a place of great fear. Do you know whether, do you, what do you think? Do you think God, Jesus actually felt fear? Many of us think that maybe Jesus was not afraid, he was brave. But first of all, Jesus in Luke's account, it says that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he sweated blood like, and he, he bled like sweat. His blood just flowed down, dripped down like sweat. Now this is not figurative. There is really a medical, a rare medical phenomenon 
called hematohydrosis, which means that which where a person bleeds like sweat. And it's caused by extreme mental anguish, it's caused by fear. It happened more often, most often, among people who are about to be executed. A deep, terrifying fear. And Jesus then prayed to his Father and said, If it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not your will, but mine. But Jesus was terrified. He was terrified of what he was going through as a human being. He faced great fear. And that's consistent with what the Bible says, that Jesus was tempted, but he did not succumb. He, was not, he did not sin. Jesus felt great fear. And he knows that we all feel great fear over many things. Some of us fear our futures. We fear people. We fear disasters. We fear ourselves. We fear others. We are people who are filled with fear. And Jesus wanted to feel that fear as well. And yet, in the midst of his fear, he obeyed God nonetheless. He said to God, God, your will, not mine in the midst of his fear. But Jesus did not want to be sedated just to lessen his fear, just to make him less conscious of the fear that was in his heart. He felt the depth of it to the extent that he sweated blood. And then the other one that's common sin is avarice. Verse 35, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Everest is not simply the love of money. It is the love of money to the extent of exclusion of other things. Think of it. These soldiers saw Jesus hanging there and they couldn't wait to take off his clothes. No sense of his dignity, no care for his dignity. I mean, the clothes, Jesus wasn't a rich man. Jesus had barely anything. He had a cloak, a coat, and inner garment. And they take all of it. They never considered anything about his dignity, about at least letting him be fully clothed till he died and then take. But instead, they took his clothes, tore it into four parts, and his inner garment, undergarment, they just threw lots and split it up. Such was their avarice, their love for money. But love for money is something that is so common to all of us. We are so often tied down and obsessed with money. I was doing, I was attending a course on criminology, and one of the things the sociologists said was that for Chinese, or well, most Chinese, the one cause of crime is money. For other races, there are other things. But for Chinese, the one obsession for Chinese is money. And we know that from the gambling dens, we know that from different vices, that we are money-obsessed people. And sometimes we suffer that from others who are money-obsessed and they do things just for money and they don't care for your feelings, they don't care for your rights, they don't care for justice for you. But we have done that to others too. That the one consideration in our heads is do we save money? Do we earn money? Do we benefit with money? Money is the one main cause in our lives and few other things matter to us. Money was foremost in the minds of the guards, the Roman soldiers. Nothing else mattered. Not the dignity of Jesus. Nothing at all. It's such a sin that we are victims of that from others. We are also perpetrators of that. In our pursuit for money, we also hurt others. Sometimes deliberately inflicting harm, sometimes just ignoring the needs of others. When someone comes with a need and we think, well, that's more of my money, we don't give because money is so important to us. Everest was something that affected Jesus because on the cross, he was stripped naked just to take his clothes away. And then there was cynicism. Those who passed, in verse 39, it says, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, 
you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. This was like a loss of faith, loss of hope. These were, many of these were the people that Jesus ministered to. He may have healed them. He may have helped them who were blind to see. He may even raise some of them from the dead. These were people who had been ministered to by Jesus. And yet at that moment, in the moment of need, they challenged, they laughed at Jesus and said, you, you can't even do anything. Really, are you that good? They had become cynical. They had lost the faith in God. But you know that, again, is so much like human nature. God helps us. We pray desperately, God help me, and God helps me. And then I have great testimonies to tell. But the next moment when I face another problem, say, well, I, I'm not sure if God helps me. But God, where are you? God, will you help me? God, really, you're useless. Not much of a help to me. That's so like our nature as well. One moment, God, I praise you for helping me. God, you're such a wonderful, good God. The next moment when we face another problem, God, you for real. God, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. But when it is Jesus facing such cynicism, what happens to his heart? The ones whom he healed, the ones whom he cared for, now turning away from him. Some were not just laughing at him. Some were shouting, crucify him. I wonder how Jesus would have felt the indignation, the anger, the sadness. I was watching a, a drama. Um, it was about a doctor who had treated and saved the life of a man. But that man turned around and kidnapped the, doc the doctor and abused her and did terrible things to her. And... Inside, I felt such great indignation. This man should be killed. This man should hang. Uh, this man should go to hell. Here was this kind doctor who had saved the man's life. What he should have done would he, would, should have been to turn over a new leaf, to be a good man, to be a grateful man. Instead, he kidnaps her and does terrible things to her. What an inhuman person. I wonder if that would have passed across Jesus' mind as well. I did these things for you. I saved you. I taught you. I helped you. And now you're shouting like all the others, crucify him. And you're laughing in my face and saying, are you really God? You are. I don't see it. But it was not just the common people that mocked him. There were also the chief priests teachers of the law and the elders in verse 41. And they said he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. We'll believe him. He says he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. The chief priests, the elders were a different category. They were people who were supposed to know. And they knew in the heart of hearts that Jesus was right. They knew that they were, they were used, actually unable to help in many things. Jesus healed. They couldn't heal. Jesus cleansed the leper. They excluded the lepers. Jesus taught about love for God. They did not love God. And so inside them, they knew that Jesus was right. But they just needed some excuse to cancel Jesus. You can't even save yourself. If you could save yourself, if you could do such a wonderful miracle, we would believe in you. But Jesus had done a million miracles and they waited for this chance to say that he couldn't save himself. It is something that is also what we have experienced and what we have done to others as well. Some of you may have been victims of gossip or the cancel culture where you make one mistake, or sometimes it's not even a mistake. Sometimes it's a vicious, malicious gossip about you, and then you say, and then everyone says this one is wrong. This person is not worth listening to. This person is a sinner. That's what they did to Jesus. They knew in the heart of hearts that he was right. 
but they found an excuse to say that she was wrong. Some of you may have been victims of that. That you were doing what was right and what was honourable to God. But someone said that you had bad motives. That you were not faithful. You were not right. And suddenly all that you've done, all that you've cared for has been cancelled. And you feel that grievance, that pain. Some of us have done that at the same time to others. Where we have known that someone is right, but we would pass the rumour. I know it happens all the time because in primary school, I've known children who were who were maligned against, who, who others had vicious gossip against them. Little children, starting from young, they had these things. We feel that great pain. Jesus did not want to be sedated against that either. He wanted to feel the pain of those who have been aggrieved. See, at the end of the day, in verse 46, it says, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some commentators think that it's because Jesus then bore the sins of the world and God forsook him. I think there was something more to it. Because what he was saying was an echo of what David, King David said in Psalm 22 verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I live in a God-forsaken world. I am surrounded by hostile, evil people who do things to me, who care more about money and betray me for money, who use their power to make me do things to condemn me simply because they could, who malign against me, who speak evil of me. And, and King David in that place, in that context, cried out to God, Everyone hates me. I'm surrounded by people who seek my life. God, where are you? You do not exist, do you? And Jesus cried that same cry. And to some of us then, it may seem really blasphemous. How could Jesus dare to say something like, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, he is Jesus himself. If I were to say God has forsaken me, I, I think I would be in trouble too. The people who say, Pastor, also say like that. But Jesus felt the full brunt of evil in the world. And he felt that pain of God of living in a God-forsaken world. And so in that pain, in that anguish, he cried out to God, God, why have you forsaken me? It's not kosher. It's not something that a Christian, a normal good Christian would say about God. And yet many in our hearts would say that too, when we experience deep pain and betrayal, and abuse of power. And Jesus felt that way. And he did not, he did not anesthetize himself, he did not sedate himself so that he would not feel it. But he wanted to feel the pain, the anguish, the injustice of what each of us goes through. What's the point of all that? The point is this, that Jesus also promised us a life that is full and abundant. And a God who makes promises and then is willing to suffer the pain that we go through is a God that we can trust. Many people will say many things, many promises. But the one thing that we shirk, the one thing that we shrink from, is even hearing the pain and the anguish of another person, much less feel the pain and the anguish of another person. But Jesus was willing to feel that pain. And we can then trust that the promises he makes, that there will be an abundant life for each of us to walk that way. We can believe in Him. But we can also believe in a God who loves us so much that He's willing to go through that pain without being sedated. That when we go through the most extreme pain in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Paul says, 
he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not give us all things through him? What this means is that God, even in the most painful of circumstances, God is doing his best to redeem. And there is good at the end of it. Jesus went through great pain. But the end of it was that he rose in victory. And there is a good ending. And so Jesus is saying to us too, that when we go through the most difficult times of our lives, God is trying, doing his best to give us a wonderful ending and there will be a wonderful ending. To hang on to him because he feels that pain, he knows that pain and he will journey with us. Let us pray. Father, help us each day and every moment as we face the pains of life, as we feel face the injustices of life, when we face abuse, when people can do things to us simply because they can. Father, when people mock us even when we have done right, when we are unjustly penalised simply because it makes a profit for others, Father, when we face every kind of injustice and every fear and every pain, help us to remember that you are with us. That you have felt that pain, you know that you have been tempted as we are, have been. And you know and you understand the pain. But more than just understanding us, Lord, you also show us that there is a beauty at the end of it all. The judge doesn't just end there. You did not just end up dead in the cross after suffering. But that you rose again in victory, having defeated death and fear. That God, there will be justice. We will be comforted. Because, Lord, when we leave this place, there will be no more tears, no more weeping. There will be joy and there will be security. We can trust in you, we can believe that. Because you love us enough to feel that pain, to experience that pain that we feel. But Father, you teach us too that your comfort comes not in removing the pain, but in coming alongside us and sharing that pain with us. So Lord, we pray that you will help us to understand this love that you have for us. But day by day also help us to be people who will share the pain with others. That you make us more and more patient with those who have much anguish, those who have much resentment, those who have much pain in their lives that though we are troubled by their pains and their complaints, that you teach us to come alongside them and to love as you love, to feel their pain as you feel ours. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let us rise. sing with joy and with gratitude about our Father's love.
like it. Why should I claim from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have. As we do each month when we have communion, we have the children come to join us. Um, the children ready? Okay, good. They're coming in, I think. But anyway, here's uh, something about the children. First of all, it is a very important ministry, and we are looking for more teachers. If you feel an inclination to teach, um, please come and talk to me or to Andrea or Magdalene, any of the Sunday children's ministry teachers. If you want to take a look at what it is before you commit yourself, uh, we're having a children's program um, in two Fridays' time in June, um, and we need helpers. So just to, just to try out, it will be a good good opportunity, no big commitment, just one time come and play with the children and see if that's an area that you would want to commit yourself to. Now let's begin our Holy Communion with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, the good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering to us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts, of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honour and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let's come forward now to take the elements.
let us stand. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ that's been broken for us. Let's take this and remember God. This is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for us. Let us now pray together the thanksgiving prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give others ourselves to others in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rests and abide with you now and always. Amen. Please take your seats. God bless you. <laughs>